بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على من بعث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه ومن اهتدى بهديه واستنى بسنته إلى يوم الدين وبعد Honorable and respected brothers, distinguished and esteemed sisters Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh There's actually quite a few points that I would like to speak about in today's Jumu'ah Friday sermon and address uh, especially since I've been standing here I think today after maybe close to a month close to maybe two months actually so there's a few points inshallah let's see I hope uh, time is not against me but uh, first and foremost uh, I'm sure like myself all of us we are deeply um, shocked and saddened by the London tube explosion this morning our thoughts and prayers go out to the victims and uh, those that are injured, I think 18 of them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant them a swift and speedy recovery. And uh, may the perpetrators be held accountable and brought to justice. But at the same time, I think it's absolutely important for us as Muslims and human beings in general that uh, we condemn all forms of terrorism. Whether it's terrorism or extremism perpetrated by supposed Muslims in the name of Islam, perverting the beautiful religion of Islam, or it may be state-sanctioned terrorism. What about the hundreds of thousands of Rohingya Muslims that are victims of state-sanctioned, state-sponsored terrorism that is being committed in broad daylight? Who is there to speak up for them? Who is there to defend them? Who is there to condemn the uh, genocide and uh, the pitiful crisis? Someone needs to speak. So may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala uh, make it easy for all of them. I know the address last week, the Jumu'ah sermon last week was about the uh, crisis in Burma and Myanmar. But to be honest, uh, there's no signs of the uh, crisis abating. So I think it's imperative and it's important for all of us as Muslims to continuously and to continue speaking about and raising awareness of injustice wherever it might be. We need to do this. This is not just our moral responsibility, but it is also our religious and Islamic responsibility. Just in the last three weeks, okay, just they are, the Rohingya Muslims are known as, they, they, they termed the most persecuted, the largest persecuted community, the largest persecuted minority, just in the last three weeks, since 25th of August, last three or so weeks, close to 400,000, over 370,000 Rohingyans have had to leave not just their properties, but had to leave walking with just the clothes that they have on their bodies. And the host did not welcome them, or the hosts did not welcome them with open arms. They were treated with an eye of suspicion, looked, out, looked at as a security threat, as a threat to national security. Whichever countries have accepted them. Out of these close to 400,000 refugees, about 250, 270,000 of them are little children. 52, 53,000 of them are pregnant and lactating women. Close to 2,000 of them are unaccompanied minors. No parents, no family. Where are they going to go to? You know, this is nothing short of a mass genocide that we're witnessing at the moment. No matter how much we speak about it, no matter how much we write about it, no matter how much of awareness we raise about it, it is always short in proportion to the oppression that's meet and the injustice that's meted out against them. This is a mass genocide. It's a mass exodus. Okay, and there's, there's irrefutable evidence for this. So as Muslims especially, I think it's important for us to ensure that we strike the right balance. You know, we condemn all forms of terrorism. Sometimes what happens is, you know, we use this pulpit of ours as, and I'm speaking on behalf of myself, and I'm not speaking on behalf of yourselves, but I'm speaking on behalf of myself, especially as Imams, when we stand up here, it is our responsibility, not just as Muslims, but as law-abiding citizens, to condemn terrorism. But then sadly, what happens at times is we overlook, at times conveniently undermine and ignore terrorism when the victims are Muslims. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them 
May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala aid them and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist them. I know last week there were some points that were given. What can we do as Muslims here in Peterborough? Just a few points, you know, nothing new, just reiterating the same, um, you know, let's continue this awareness as much as we can do. Humanitarian workers, you know, there's, there's restricted access, restricted a access to journalists. So raise as, as much awareness as you can. I know last week there was a meeting here with the local MP in Peterborough. Continue, you know, lobbying your MPs, write letters and uh, help them financially, even if it means any valid uh, charity or organization that's working there uh, with the Rohingya Muslims, help them, support them, you know, a pound, two pounds, 10 pounds, 20 pounds, whatever it might be. We are all sitting here comfortably, okay? No fear, no terror, nothing whatsoever. We will leave the masjid, you will go to your car, you will walk to your houses, you will have a nice hot meal in front of you. You have your parents in front of you, your beautiful children in front of you, you have your partners in front of you. These individuals have nothing. They have no roof above them. The sky is the roof. They have no bed below them. The floor is their bed. And they have no food. Who is going to help and who is going to support them? This is not the state in which the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left the Ummah. This is certainly not the state. The Muslims, when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam made first contact with the aggressive, downtrodden, uh, in complete decadence, individuals and Arabs, then they were split, they were in fragments. But when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left, he left them as one body, as one united force, as a strong group. And this is the state in which Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala took the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Before the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam could achieve this, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala did not take the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. This was a fundamental part of the mission of the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know, at times, I'm sure you would be able to appreciate this example. And, you know, we all have a similar tale in our families. At times, you know, the family is well connected, strong, united. And then for whatever reason, there's, there's a breakout, there's a difference in the family, siblings are not talking to one another, there's no communication. And, uh, you know, this goes on for a few months, at times maybe even for a few years. And then eventually there's a tragic death in the family. And now this is an excuse. In fact, this is an opportunity for the family to get together. And then the family gets together and they forget, they put the differences aside. Why? Because of this one death. As a Muslim ummah, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam left us as a family. How many more deaths are we waiting for? Weren't the deaths in Kashmir enough? Weren't the deaths in Sham, in Syria enough? Weren't the deaths in Palestine enough? Weren't the deaths in Afghanistan enough? Weren't the deaths in Somalia enough? And now we have more and more ever increasing deaths in Burma and Myanmar. This is a strategic ethnic cleansing. You know, entire villages are being set ablaze and they're being torched. By who? Not just vigilante mobs, by the security forces, by the Myanmar military. So this is state sanctioned. When the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, I mentioned this before and I would never tire mentioning this. There was an instance when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam went on a campaign and uh, when he returned, the young children of Medina went out, Medina, uh, looking forward to embracing and welcoming their fathers. And there was a young boy who comes straight to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he poses a very difficult question to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Ya Rasulullah, where's my father? Oh, the Messenger of Allah, my young friends, they are in the arms of their fathers. I do not see my father. If I correctly recall, I remember my father left Medina with you. Where is he right now, Ya Rasulullah? The Messenger Sallallahu was reduced to tears. He could not respond. You know, he answered the most philosophical and the most intellectual of questions. But this was a question that startled and dumbfounded the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi could not do anything but turn his head away, thinking that the child might forget. And the child then comes to the side of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And he says, Ya Rasulullah, where's my father? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi turns again, Ya Rasulullah, where's my father? The Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was nothing but Rahmatul Lil Alameen was a mercy not just to Muslims but to non-Muslims likewise to the animal kingdom likewise to even the inanimate creation of Allah Subhanahu Wa Ta'ala He picks up this young boy in his arm Bashir Radiallahu Anhu and the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says Ama Tarda that aren't you happy O young man that from today onwards Muhammad is your father 
and Aisha, my wife is your mother. This put a broad smile on the face of this young man. He forgot the loss of his father. Where are the Muhammads of today? And where are the Aishas of today? We are adherents of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The beautiful followers of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The uh, adherents of the beautiful religion of Islam. Aren't we going to stand up and say to these young children that, listen, you might have lost, tragically, you might have lost your biological parents, but we are here to take care of you. We understand the pain. We understand what it means as children to need parents. We have our own children. We are children ourselves. We need our parents. We need that comfort. We need that support. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help them. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala guide them. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala assist them. The next point I wanted to speak about is related to the, what I just spoke about. Last week, Friday, as I was leaving the masjid, I met some brothers who actually, uh, you know, due to uh, civil war in the countries that they've left, they were forced to migrate and the beautiful city of Peterborough were, you know, actually welcomed them with open arms. So I met some of these brothers and I started speaking to them outside the masjid and we had a long conversation. Anyway, you know, as I left the masjid, a few days thereafter, just a few days ago, one of these brothers got in touch with me and he says that I was employed by a Muslim employer here in Peterborough and I worked for him for close to a month and he was supposed to pay me nearly a thousand pounds and he refused so eventually he says we settled at the figure 400 pounds and he says at the moment he's only paid me a hundred pounds and he says I don't want to see your face again he says if I calculate he's paid me about a pound an hour this is a Muslim by the way and then you know we speak about liberating al-masjid al-aqsa we speak about reinstating the caliphate we speak about uh, solving the Burmese crisis. We need to reinstate humanity in ourselves first. Let alone liberating Al-Aqsa. We need to liberate our souls first. This is the Ummah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. We will be questioned when the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was on his deathbed. You know the last words that he uttered weren't, Oh my beloved wife Aisha. Oh, my beloved daughter Fatima, you know, I've got these properties, make sure you take care, of, take care of that. You know, I've got this business, make sure you take care of that. No, no, no. What were the last words that came out that were uttered by the greatest human being ever to set foot on the surface of this earth? What did he say? He said, As-salah, as-salah, wa ma malakat aymanukum. Oh, my ummah, in a nutshell, the 23 years of my prophetic career, if I could summarize it, and provide a, a, a synopsis in just two sentences. It is as salah, as salah, wa ma malakat aymanukum. Take care of your salah. Take care of your salah. Take care of your prayers. Number one. And number two, wa ma malakat aymanukum. Take care of your subordinates. Take care of those who you have been made responsible of. Look after them because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala awwalu shay'in yuhasabu bihi al-abdu yawm al-qiyam as-salah The first thing that Allah will question you and I on judgment day when we stand in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala will be the right of Allah that is salah and as far as the rights the dues that we have the rights that we owe others Allah is going to ask us about how we treated those around us kullukum ra'in wa kullukum mas'ulun an ra'iyatihi the messenger sallallahu alayhi wasallam says each and every single one of you in your own capacity whether as an employer whether as a father whether as a mother brother sister whatever it might be each and every single one of you is responsible of someone or the other and Allah is going to ask you about that Allah is going to question you about that Allah is going to ask you and Allah is going to question you about that that's the second thing I wanted to speak about the third point I know many of you mashallah you've just performed your Hajj and you've returned many of our other brothers and sisters uh, will be with us soon. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept there and may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala accept your hajj. May he grant you a hajj mabroor. In Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Al hajj al mabroor, laysa lahu jazaun illa al jannah. That you ask Allah for a hajj mabroor, a righteous, a successful, and accepted, a transformative hajj. That's what we need to ask Allah for. And the reward of that hajj is nothing short than paradise and the jannah of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. In another hadith also in Sahih Bukhari, Sahih Muslim, the Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa mentions, Man hajja lillah falam yarfuth wa lam yafsuq raja'a ka yawmi waladathu umhu. The one who performs the hajj, this sacred 
ritual of pilgrimage, the one who embarks on this journey, Lillah, only for Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, and nothing else, and no one else. فَلَمْ يَرْفُثْ وَلَمْ يَفْسُقْ The Messenger Sassim doesn't say that the person cries in the, the plains of Arafat and, and, and clings on to the, uh, clings on to the Kaaba and so on. The Messenger Sassim says, فَلَمْ يَرْفُثْ وَلَمْ يَفْسُقْ The individual is not vulgar, the individual is not obscene. Then what is the reward of this Hajj? رَجَعَكَ يَوْمِ وَلَدَتْهُ أُمُّهُ The person will return as though the individual was given birth to by his or her mother. Clean slate, no sins whatsoever. For those of us that, are, that went, went on Hajj, we might be wondering how do I know? I've spent so much of money, you know, I've taken leave from my work, left my family, my children, and I went on this Hajj, this arduous, difficult journey. How do I know if Allah has accepted this Hajj? The ulama mentioned there are, three, there are few signs. I'll just mention one or two signs. Number one, they mention that this Hajj should be performed according to the Sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. The way the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed the Hajj. When the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed his Hajj, at every moment, at every juncture, the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned, خُذُوا عَنِّي مَنَاسِكَكُمْ That, oh my, oh my Muslim Ummah. When the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was in Arafah, he mounted on his conveyance. When he was in Muzdalifa, he mounted on his conveyance. When he performed the circumambulation, the circuit of the tawaf, the circuiting of the, of the Kaaba, the tawaf the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed, it was on his conveyance. The reason for this was not the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam was injured or he was weak or he was old. No, the reason was so that everyone could see the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performing these rituals. And the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam at every moment said, خُذُوا عَنِّي مَنَاسِكَكُمْ خُذُوا عَنِّي مَنَاسِكَكُمْ that take your rituals from me. Do it the way I am doing it. Number one, if we did it according to the sunnah of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, the way the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam performed the Hajj, and eventually the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam mentioned that لا, uh, that is, there's a great possibility that this is the only Hajj that I am going to perform. The next Hajj, I will not be performing this Hajj. Number one. Number two, the income and the wealth that, they, that you use to perform the Hajj it needs to be from a, a, from a lawful, from a halal source. A beautiful hadith recorded by Imam Tabarani, rahmatullahi alayhi. He says that the Messenger, sallallahu, Abu Hurairah radiallahu anhu, of the hadith, he says the Messenger, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, mentioned that when the individual, let alone reaches the, the holy sanctuary, when the individual gets into the, uh, the state of pilgrim sanctity, the ihram state, and the individual utters, labbaik, Allahumma labbaik, if the source, if the wealth of that hajj was lawful and halal, then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala responds by saying, Allah responds by saying that hajjuka mabrur wa sa'yuka mashkur wa dhambuka maghfur that your hajj is mabrur it is an accepted hajj wa sa'yuka mashkur and your efforts have been uh, your, 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 your efforts have been appreciated by, by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wa dhambuka maghfur and your sins have been forgiven on the other hand if the income if the wealth that was used if the predominant majority even income of this individual is through a haram source drugs alcohol stealing, scamming, not paying your employees, whatever the case might be, you might as well say not once, not twice, a thousand times the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam says, cry out, labbaik Allahumma labbaik. But each time Allah responds by saying, hajjuka ghayru mabrur, wa sa'yuka ghayru mashkur, wa dhambuka ghayru maghfur. Your hajj is refused. It is not accepted. It is rejected. Wa sa'yuka ghayru mashkur. Allah does not need your efforts. Allah does not appreciate your efforts. Wa dhambuka ghayru maghfur. No matter how long you stood in Arafah, five hours, ten hours in the scorching heat of Arabia, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَذَنْبُكَ غَيْرُ مغفور. Your sins are not forgiven. Your sins are not forgiven. Let's make a start. If we want to help our brothers and sisters across the globe, let's start off by helping ourselves first. I need to reform myself. You need to reform yourself. We all have our weaknesses. We all have our imperfections. Whether it's in our relationship with people around us, family members, or otherwise, or our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala help us. May Allah assist us. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala make it easy for us. وصلى الله على نبينا محمد وعلى اله وصحبه اجمعين واخر دعوانا ان الحمد لله رب العالمين